Today I'd like to talk about issues about intellectual property right and health care. In particular, I want to start out by talking about the campaign involving trade issues about patents and access to medicine. And then after we talk about the international discussion somewhat, I want to talk a bit more about the situation in the United States and Europe. Uh, one of the first and most important campaigns that took place having to do with access to medicine took place in Thailand. Thailand was under enormous pressure from the United States back in the 80s, pushed by companies like Pfizer and others to change the way that the laws were about medicines and patents on medicines, to uh, provide higher levels of protection for pharmaceuticals, to, uh, to benefit uh, the American companies primarily and European companies that were selling in that market. As a consequence, Thailand repealed a lot of uh, its existing laws. They, they required pharmaceuticals to be covered by patents. They imposed all kinds of non-patent barriers to trade and that led to much higher prices for pharmaceuticals. Beginning really um, in 1997 and 1998, public health groups began to push in Thailand for changes in the, uh, in, the, in the Thai policies. And they began to organize by 1998 protest in Thailand, criticizing the U.S. government for its trade pressures on Thailand and pushing for broader access to medicines. In 1998 in the fall, there was a protest in particular at the, uh, in September at the uh, U.S. Embassy where they presented the U.S. Embassy with a letter to Charlene Barshevsky, then the U.S. Trade Minister, and Donna Shalala, then the U.S. Head of the Department of Health and Human Services, asking that they, uh, they, the United States cease pressures about a compulsory license and on uh, DDI, which is a drug for AIDS, and that Donna Shalala investigate the pricing of of DDI, which was a drug that was produced under a government grant and licensed uh, to Bristol Myers Squibb. There was a, one of the interesting things about the dispute in Thailand was that the U.S. government had not filed a patent in Thailand for the product, but Bristol Myers had gotten through the Thai Patent Office a patent on a formulation of the drug, a patent which had actually been rejected by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, and they got that patent years after the product had been on the market in the United States. And they used that to prevent the government in Thailand from producing its own version of, of DDI for AIDS patients. Now Thailand had about one million HIV positive people at the time. And the price for AIDS drugs were really too expensive for anyone to be receiving multiple drug therapy, which was what was required for public health purposes. There was also a um, a dispute over a drug called fluconazole, which was used for cryptococcal meningitis. And they were, the campaign in 1998 was successful by the Thai NGOs to get the exclusive marketing privileges removed for fluconazole. As a consequence, the price of fluconazole dropped from 200 baht, which is the local Thai currency, to 6.5 baht in nine months, a price decrease of over 95%. That meant that this drug, which was used to treat a very painful brain fungus, which affected about 10% of the AIDS patients in Thailand, became available for treatment. The success of the Thai campaign on fluconazole energized public health groups throughout the world. In March 1999, there was a conference on compulsory licensing of patents in Geneva where the Thai uh, NGO groups made presentations and people from Africa and Asia and all, Latin America all over the world attended. And it was really the launch of the modern campaign for compulsory licensing of patents on medicines. What most people probably hear or read about is the situation in Africa, where if you go back about two years ago, the major drug companies were trying to charge ten to $15,000 for three drug therapy for HIV drugs in the African market. Today, we can now buy a one pill twice a day formulation from an Indian manufacturer for a, a triple therapy regime for antiretroviral drugs in, in Africa for $250 a year. That's an enormous change and it, it illustrates, I think, some of the uh, huge ethical issues that are, that are inherent on the idea of imposing on, a, on the entire world a U.S. and European style method of patent protection. You have a situation, for example, in South Africa, one country where there's about uh, 
20,000 people per month that are dying of AIDS. And um, it's a terrible tragedy that's unfolding. In some countries, they think that more than half of the young people will die of AIDS within the next 10 years. It's a, a colossal holocaust of just staggering uh, moral uh, and social implications. And the response of the global community has been rather distressing. It, it is, this, this debate has been portrayed as a trade issue, as some kind of tension between the profits of the companies and, and, uh, and the interest of the patients in a way that, that, that is, is surprising because if you were to take this entire dispute and put it in the context of the United States and Europe, there would be no dispute about the fact that prices of a product that made the, the product completely unavailable to a population, particularly something that was just an, an unbelievable ap epidemic in terms of the number of people that are affected, there's no question about the fact that the United States and Europe would act to rein in the patent rights to make the product available. In fact, the United States does this routinely for areas outside of the medical area. We issued compulsory licenses last year on tow truck patents. We issued compulsory licenses on, on, on corn seeds, on uh, satellite technology. Uh, we're considering compulsory licenses right now on um, patents on gasoline additives and and on, um, on uh, TV guide technology for uh, interactive television. So when the United States thinks that there's a problem with patent laws and it, it, it's a problem that would be fixed through compulsory licensing of a patent, we take care of the problem. Europe, uh, just in the month of July, issued a compulsory license for a database of pharmaceutical prices in Germany. And again, they did it because they thought that uh, um, there were just market failure problems from the issuance of the, of the stronger form of intellectual property rights. The difference in poorer countries is that they're not as sophisticated about the intellectual property right regime, and they have kind of a, a cartoon character version of the problem. It's described to them in ways that are sort of simplified uh, versions of, of, you know, intellectual property rights good, no intellectual property rights bad, you know, kind of very polarized, simplistic ideas. The richness of the European American system is not explained by people in developing countries because it's really a uh, sort of a, uh, 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 there's a situation in, in the South where it, it is the trade negotiators, it's the World Intellectual Property Organization, it's uh, U.S. embassies, it's sort of NGOs which are funded by drug companies and funded by the motion picture industry and funded by uh, the U.S. State Department that go out and, and carry on this sort of missionary zeal to spread, you know, the good world about how great intellectual property rights are and how necessary they are and kind of oblivious to the actual situations of various countries where these are being imposed and oblivious also of the capacity of these poor countries to resolve disputes. Now, if you look at the United States, you observe that there's a lot of litigation in the United States over patent rights. You observe Merck's uh, suing um, other drug companies. I mean, the big pharma companies, they sue each other. The biotech companies, they sue each other. The big guys sue the little guys. The little guys sue the big guys. They spend millions of dollars on patent litigation. The AZT patent case cost over $100,000 per day to litigate that dispute. And it's not uncommon for people to spend a million dollars a month in billing on a, on a on an important pharmaceutical patent dispute. It's routine in the United States that when a drug is coming off patent, that a company will file a bunch of very poor quality, controversial patents on the product to extend the exclusivity for years just based on the fact that it takes a long time to litigate the disputes and it's expensive. And we, we basically don't really think of patents in this country as necessarily being valid until the judge determines whether they are or not. Well, the problem in the developing countries is they can't litigate these patents. They can't hire the lawyers. They can't go into a courtroom. They have really no capacity to, uh, to resolve disputes in the same way that they resolve in the United States. So you have, as in the Thailand case and in countless cases in African markets, you have controversial patent assertions which are unchallenged and unrebutted because nobody can afford the litigation and they can't afford to resolve the disputes in those markets like they would here. Which means, you know, effectively, they end up with higher forms of protection than they have here. And you have a situation where countries, when they try and enact legislation, they, re, they, re, they, they, they end up with all kinds of problems. 
Like in South Africa, they passed a law which should have given the health minister the right to have a fairly straightforward and administratively simple way to issue a compulsory license on a patent. They were sued by 39 drug companies and they were brought to court and it took years to litigate. The suit by the drug companies was filed in 1998. The court went to trial this year, in the year 2001. And over that period of time, the South African government couldn't use the law. It took them a very long time just to hire, to find lawyers in South Africa that knew anything about patent law that weren't already working for the drug companies. And then the drug companies were able to more or less once they're in courtroom, it's like throwing bear rabbit in the bear, in the you know in the briar patch. I mean, they really know how to play in the courtroom, and it's an it's an environment where they're used to delay, delay, delay things like that. So one thing that we focused on is what type of systems do you need in poor countries that are consistent with the capacity of countries to hire lawyers, to provide expert witnesses, and to sort of deal with the uh, the the expense. Of, of, of the system which is we've sort of designed in the United States and Europe as our, as our system of resolving these disputes. We think you need something different in Bangladesh. We think you need something different in Uganda and Nigeria than you have in France, the United States, and England. We, we think you need a system which is more of an administrative system. It's less costly to administer and faster. Um, all of those things are permitted in the current tra trade agreements. Uh, they may not be permitted in some of the regional trade agreements, but in the WTO, WTO TRIPS agreement, intellectual property, right, countries can adopt these simplified administrative systems. And one thing we're working on with countries is to develop new models of compliance with trade agreements, which are consistent with their own public health needs and consistent with their capacity to litigate things. Now, there's also an issue in the rich countries. What we have in the United States in addition to the massive problems of, of entry barriers for generic drugs on old drugs, which should be off patent now and should be cheap now because billions of dollars have already gone to the, to the innovators. Um, the uh, patent protection is, is, is you know, long since expired what would, on the initial product. And the extension of the exclusivity is based upon a range of anti-competitive practices and delaying tactics and misuses the patent system. But even more important, in my opinion, is the new intellectual property environment based on the new uh, high-tech medicine, on the new uh, system of, uh, of uh, uh, patents on genetic information, um, intellectual property right on, um, on, on a variety of forms of, uh, of data uh, that's being proposed, um, the, uh, the complex intellectual property rights in particular products. It's no longer the case that you have to think about one patent, one product. You have all these patents on research tools and things like that, on doses, on diagnostic procedures, and a million of other things. And so what you observe now in the United States and Europe is a new crisis in intellectual property right in the healthcare area. As the scope of patenting has really been broad and it's easier to get patents, you can get them on all sorts of things that people didn't get them on before. And you have now uh, much more extensive patenting, partly because of the changes in uh, the U.S. Federal Bayh-Dole Act on research tools. And uh, this whole proliferation of, uh, of uh, very aggressive licensing terms by the biotech sector on research tools, on, on uh, reach through royalties, uh, on the stacking up of uh, various IPR claims, to the point now where the big pharma companies themselves are much more open and sympathetic to a system of, of, uh, of compulsory licensing in the United States to the degree that it actually deals with the stuff that they have to buy, which are the inputs to their products. Because they think that to an excessive amount of intellectual property right on the products creates barriers to development of new products. They abandon research in an area where there are too many blocking patents and too many, uh, and, and the, and too many unreasonable terms on some of the research tools that are needed. Uh, this is a growing problem and the big drug companies are kind of in a difficult spot because they want to maintain strong intellectual property protection on the final sale of the products, but they recognize they need weaker intellectual property in the area of the research tools and the inputs for their products. Uh, there's also people that are beginning to question the entire model of patents as the best way to reward innovators on biotech inventions. What they're saying is you need systems which are based less on exclusive rights 
more on non-exclusive uh, uh, compensation models, more of a uh, uh, sui generis type approach. Uh, and some academics have, have also called attention to the fact that research is really more cumulative than, and that the winner-take-all model of the patent system is really the wrong way to think about uh, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of development process. Uh, the last thing I would add is that I as, you, as you begin to deal with the ethical problems about access to health care, the problems of needing to reduce the power of intellectual property rights in areas where they're be just being too strong creates barriers to development and you have to deal with the need to to build up the public domain as a source of information which is used by innovators you also have to ask yourself do we need new models for uh, for funding innovation is the patent model sufficient by itself or do we need to really have a different ways of funding our R&D or are, are different ways more effective, efficient, and more likely to lead to the type of innovation that we demand. So we're actually pushing within trade processes and in policy research <coughs> a lot on models for funding R&D to look beyond the traditional winner-take-all exclusive rights patent models to, to a range of ways that you can fund R&D and compensate innovators that are less restrictive for access, that raise fewer uh, ethical problems, and which are more pro-development. Thank you.